going on, YouTube? Culture Dog Sam Hatch back here with another Blu-ray review, and this is another one I've been slow to getting up and running, but uh, it's a pretty cool flick that I'd never heard of that Arrow Video sent me, and I was uh, pleasantly surprised when I watched it. It is a slasher flick from a little bit beyond the, the usual bread and butter period of the slasher era, but from 1984, it's called The Initiation. The Initiation is um, essentially a, a troubled feature from director Larry Stewart, who replaced the original director, Peter Crane, uh, rather quickly. Uh, but, you know, it's got a lot of, you know, TV feature <laughs> pedigree uh, to it. But then it's got a lot of visual verb, thanks to the, uh, the original director. Uh, and it is largely credited as the feature uh, debut of Daphne Zuniga, even though she was in The Dorm That Drip Blood. Before this, uh, but this, you know, well before she was in Spaceballs and Melrose Place, etc. Um, but she is a uh, pledging at a uh, sorority, and this film, much like Vamp, starts off with um, well, at first it starts off with a kind of neo Dan Curtis uh, flashback, you know, very uh, 70s Vaseline on the lens looking, you know, foggy uh, flashback of some horrible doings going on as uh as the main character was it was a young girl you know witnessing her mom cheating on her dad or something to that effect and some violence happening and um it's really cool because it seems like such a a, a mega cliche that you as an audience member will pick up on all sorts of stuff right away um and then assume you know everything and that was cool because you know you don't uh, but yeah, much like Vamp, from there it it does exploit a lot of like potential, you know, occult imagery uh, within like the sorority hijinks and their their rituals. But then you know, come to find out that stuff's jettisoned almost immediately, and it's just to set up a spooky atmosphere as it introduces Kelly, you know, Daphne Zuniga's character and her friends as they're you know being pledged and this is the, the week of their initiation at the end of the week that they're going to have their final initiation there's also going to be a party and all sorts of hazing and whatnot uh, but the final kind of hazing event derives from the fact that you know one of the other girls in the sorority dislikes kelly already because her stepfather is a rich mall owner and so the concept is that Kelly's going to have to steal the keys to get into the back the mall and they go in there and like steal some stuff uh from the security guard that works there and um yeah typical goofy hijinks or whatever so uh, but hunter tylo's in there as well you know the, the girls are you know obviously exploited for you know, a lot of like window scenery of uh you know stalker image and there's some um handheld cam work definitely aping dean kundi's work on halloween even the lighting the exterior lighting there's a lot of like that that kind of dean kundi blue action going on there uh, but yeah, one scene in particular, you know, uh, is definitely trying to invoke Halloween memories. But the Panaglide work in Halloween totally smokes this stuff. It's it's very, especially watching it on a big screen in high def, it's very, very jumpy and choppy, the handheld work, and nowhere near as smooth as any of the Steadicam stuff from Carpenter Flicks. Uh, so in, on that regard, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fail. Uh, but just the fact that it was trying to do something cool and, and energetic... Uh, there's a lot of like, killer cam footage and stuff like that, uh, especially in the earlier portion of the film. But yeah, Kelly is routinely troubled by these memories as uh, as a youth, and so she also goes to this dream clinic. And James Reed from uh, Charmed <laughs> is in there, young, super young, and uh, he's trying to guide her through some uh, sleep studies and and try and get at what's what's troubling her. So you've got those scenarios kind of bouncing off one another, and there's also an attraction to James Reed, etc. But she's just a young girl trying to have a good time. And there's also uh, a scenario going on at a local uh, asylum, including a dangerous-looking man who was also in the uh, Dan Curtis Vaseline on the Lens dream sequence, who uh, has a garden weasel. And shortly uh, thereafter, people get garden weaseled to death. Or actually just, yeah regular like hand hoe but i like to call it a garden weasel even though it's not uh <laughs> but so the murders start happening and uh there's a the the typical 80s dance party scene which is fascinating because the, the movie is you know really competent uh in in the way everything is staged and, and even when they were using 
you know, Holiday Inn bath janitor bathrooms and stuff like that as as sets. Um, th- you know, they did a really good job. But the, the continuity gets really weird at the dance number because there's a band. You know, it was all shot in Texas, so this band Refugee, the local band, uh, is performing at the party, and there's you know this this wild kind of like clash looking bass player and the drummer and a vocalist. I think just another guitarist, and then. So they're at one end of the room, and then there's the, uh, you know, the the opposite shot showing showing the crowd and the James Reed and, and Daphne Zuniga in the back kind of hanging out. But they're actually in the same spot, and you could see the bass player is behind them, and you could also see some of the drum, the drums behind them too. So it's this bizarre, like shining esque impossible space where like there's two bands or they're like in two places at once, and like. Well, like, they can't be there. That bass player can't be behind them because they just showed the establishing shot of the band on the other side of the room. And clearly they're standing, like, where the lead singer is doing this. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was, uh, they really did a, a bizarre bit of continuity uh, nonsense there. Um, but, yeah, the film really hits its stride once it goes to the uh, the shopping mall, which isn't actually a shopping mall. It's the Dallas Market Center. It's this huge monstrosity. In fact, when they have the establishing shot, I'm like, what the hell shopping mall is that? It's like some sort of post-apocalyptic bunker or something. But it uh, is this major kind of retailer showcase where people would come in and you know, uh, then like purchase things for their store. So it wasn't a consumer shopping mall. And apparently parts of that were also used for Logan's Run. And I, I got a Logan's Run vibe almost immediately um but the film really benefits from from the huge kind of spaces within it and i love the kind of low budget look uh that kind of sickly kind of greenish look that you get sometimes in in malls where you didn't have um you know a lot of you know, money for lighting and you can use kind of the lighting from the actual environment so it's got that cool look and then once all these girls arrive there some dudes are you know put up to the task of going in there to scare them and typical kind of 80 slasher nonsense ensues but the cool thing is that the killer then evolves uh, their modus operandi and the the garden weasel attack is is ditched for all sorts of cool things you know derived from the environment and you know the different stores so uh you know as everybody's creeping around they're getting killed in, in new and exciting ways and you know it is the typical like you have sex and you die thing in at least one occasion but uh it was uh, really uh, creatively put together. And uh, at the same time, you know, one of the girls, uh, Joy Jones plays this girl, Heidi, that's also part of the, you know, the dream lab, starts putting pieces of the puzzle together and, and decides to uh, inform the main characters pre-cell phones, of course, that something's going down. And uh, by that point, it's too late. And this giant uh, culmination of, of gore and, and, uh, and psychoses erupts within the shopping center. Uh, so pretty satisfying flick came out in 84 and it was completely overshadowed by the other things, including Wes Craven's nightmare on Elm street. Uh, but the funny thing for me is like, I have just no memory of, of any, this film impacting my life in any way, shape or form. I don't remember seeing any ads for it. And by 84, I mean, I was, you know, little budding cinephile and also a cable, uh, you know, addict at that time. <laughs> Uh, so the fact that I never even had any knowledge of this film existing, uh, being marketed, being in theaters, or hitting cable uh, is just completely uh, a null spot in my you know cultural map. So I was fascinated to check it out, and uh, yeah, it, it really charmed me. I, I like this film a lot. It had a good vibe, and uh, yeah, sure, it's it's a bucket of hot nonsense, but man, yeah, I really I, I like Daphne Zuniga's performance and. Everybody in the film is, you know, decent, and it's got a, a fun vibe, especially when it gets to the uh, Dallas Market Center. So yeah, the initiation, I, I, I heartily recommend it, especially for uh, slasher fans. And I'm thankful for being introduced to it. So yeah, Blu-ray, I, I can't say that I've seen it on VHS, but I'm imagining it's a major step up. I don't recall ever tripping and crossing on DVD either, but uh, so yeah, it looks great in uh, high def, and... Uh, good grain to it and it has a low budget look but has that look like you're going to see it in a in a theater in 1984 and like i said before you know the color palette uh you know 10 it looks a little fluorescent in some of the the mall scenes but i I like that i think it really felt of its time yeah 
really made me feel like I was in a mall movie in the, in the early 80s or late 70s. Um, and yeah, everything else had, had a lot of good contrast to it. And, uh, you know, a decent amount of color too. And like I said, uh, especially the, the nighttime shots with those kind of cool, cool blues on the horizon. And uh, yeah, I thought it looked great. Sound is just my uncompressed monaural uh, PCM audio. And there was actually a decent amount of uh, punch uh, the, to the lower end. I mean, it was a, like a synthesizer type score for the most part. Uh, but a lot of that stuff generated a little bit of low energy to it, which was uh, cool. Um, you know, dialogue sounded great and uh, no problems there. You know, the band Refugee <laughs> sounded off the chain during the dance party number. Um, but yeah, yeah, nothing was uh, distorted. And uh, yeah, it was, it was cool. I, I appreciate hearing just the original mono as opposed to... A super gimmicky 5.1 remix. Decent amount of extras. There is a commentary track from The Hysteria Continues, which is largely uh, J.A. Kurzweil and a ton of people. Uh, so that also means it's, you know, it's, it's very podcasty. These guys do a podcast. And uh, it's one of those things where it's like at least six or so people, maybe even more. Uh, and the audio quality is all over the map depending on each person's individual equipment and some you know sounds very you know, canned over the phone and some people sound a lot more present like they have you know better recording equipment but it's people all over the place from the UK to the southern United States so it's cool you have these like good old boys with like an Irish guy and all sorts of the people and they're all super fans of uh, you know trash cinema and in particular slasher films so um, these guys know more than you know anybody. You know, they're all like Quentin Tarantino's of slasher films, so they'll they'll talk about the most obscure like VHS video nasties, like it's you know something that James Cameron put out. Uh, so yeah, they know their stuff and they're really uh, you know interesting to listen to. And, and despite the fact that the audio quality vary, varies between them and it's like six guys talking over each other. You th got to figure with a bunch of audio lag from, you know, intercontinental conversations and stuff. Uh, it's actually, you know, pretty well paced and, and, and either if it was edited after the fact or, or whatever, but it, it flows relatively nicely, which I was impressed because I thought it was going to be a hot mess of a bunch of guys going, yeah, well, uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, it wasn't. So that was good. Uh, there's also, um, sorority saga, an interview with the writer, Charles Pratt Jr., and then a uh, Pledge Night interview with actor Christopher Bradley, who plays Chad, one of the guys that gets sent to terrorize the girls inside the mall. And then a uh, Dream Job, cool interview with Joy Jones, who was Heidi, the girl that worked with James Reed in the, the Dream Clinic. And there's also an extended scene at the dance, which is, you know, contains some of the in imagery from the film already, but just enhances it. And some of it has missing audio, but... It's cool they found it and they decided to include it anyways and it also has the original trailer the trailer that i never saw back in the day so yeah it loses some points in the the eyes of the uh the slasher purist for being outside at the time of the uh slasher sweet spot you know 1984 was a little late in the game so it's a little derivative of other films but um there is a uh, a twist in it that i thought was really well done and my wife actually said was really well done too and it, it had a lot of impact because you underestimate the film so much uh, having seen so many other knockoffs and, and similar type films and that you you think it's really not going to be able to deliver anything i haven't seen before and especially having the the kind of like hokey flashbacks where it would seem pretty obvious uh when it does drop its twist on you it's it's pretty satisfying and uh, i was i was very very pleasantly surprised by it and just overall the film has a lot of charm to it and uh yeah, I, I love it. It's cool having it on Blu-ray and all its grainy delight. And uh, it's a, you know, a low-budget uh, cool flick that I'm glad to have in my collection. So, The Initiation totally won, won me over. So, thanks for hanging out. Uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Cheers!